And uh, now I'm, I get to introduce Mike again. So uh, we all understand Mike has been in, uh, in your booklets, it says that he has been in ministry since 1979. And much of the fervor that drives his ministry is his mission, like, and I say it again, to seek those who are seeking. And he has been successful in fulfilling that particular mission, and then some through his BibleTalk.tv TV online ministry. And it is free to use. And I know some of the members in this congregation have been using it. Some of our uh, smaller groups have been using it as well. And other congregations are using that in their congregations. And I just want to uh, emphasize that it's free because of brothers and sisters in Christ who support it. And I know Mike is not going to say this. So I'm saying it on his behalf. If you have uh, benefited much from that website, BibleTalk.tv, and would like to support it financially, uh, there's, a, there's a thing on the website, right, to be able to support that uh, so that they can continue doing this, providing high-quality materials for free for, for everybody uh, in the world. So uh, with that, Mike. All right. Bonsoir. There you go. You can do it. <laughs> I um, I want to also, uh, of course, thank Jay and uh, Linda for their great hospitality. They they brought hosp you know the giving of hospitality to kind of a, a high art form at their house. Uh, also, a lot of brothers and sisters that uh, that I haven't seen in a long time or that I knew of and finally meeting for the first time here. Uh, it's been wonderful, a wonderful time of fellowship, and I think that's an important part of the program. They've left a lot of room for people to just talk and visit and get to know each other or renew acquaintances, and I'm part of that as well. And uh, for those of you who come from elsewhere that I won't be able to see tomorrow at worship, uh, it's been good to uh, to be with you and to uh, uh, to share a little bit of reminiscence about who we know in Canada and in the United States. All right, in spirit and truth, the fundamentals of biblical worship, lesson number three, the result of biblical worship, and that is transcendence, transcendence. In Western culture, we like to measure things in order to give them value. You know, the tallest, the strongest, the biggest, the fastest, the first, the most, the newest. In the Guinness uh, Book of Records, there is a man who holds the record for having the most records. You know, standing on one foot for the longest, you know, those type of goofy records. But he holds the record for having the greatest number of records in the Guinness Book of Records. So this is why we're so interested in the Olympic Games. I've talked about that. Because the Olympic Games, the ultimate measurement of human achievement in sports, that's, that's what it is. It reflects the spirit of our times where one's value is ultimately based on one's achievement. Now, a good example of this happened at the 2008 Olympics. I think many of us remember and celebrate uh, Michael Phelps, you know, the American swimmer, Michael Phelps, who won a gold medal by beating another swimmer by one one hundredth of a second. Little file there that shows you. Uh, now, uh, Phelps is on the left. Okay, he's the one without the top there. Um, one one hundredth of a second. That's a second. Well, one one hundredth of, of that. He won. But for the one who came in second, or for the one who came in third, there was no celebration, and there was no fame, and there's no fortune. Michael Phelps, he, he, he got a contract from uh, you know, different companies to represent them. He's a millionaire. He's known all over the world. One one hundredth of a second. Does anybody know who came in second? Do you know his name? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Michael Mazzalongo. Nah, <laughs> come on. Get out of here. 
No, this guy over here, uh, Milorad Savic from Serbia. Now, Milorad, you know, he's got a job in Serbia. He's got some, you know, endorsement deals in Serbia. But nothing like the guy who beat him by one one hundredth of a second. Now, I'm saying all of this because in the church, we are often influenced by the things in the world. And it's not a new phenomenon. Paul the Apostle urged the church not to be molded or conformed to this world in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So the problem existed in the first century as it does today. You see, what happens is that we are influenced by the world to judge our worship in the same way that we judge things that are strictly in the world and of the world. And we forget that worship, although done in the world, is not something of the world. It is otherworldly. And so the result or the goal of worship is not that we finish on time. <laughs> it's not that we do it right or we do it well. The goal is not that there be lots of people in attendance. You know, things that you can count, things that you can measure. Or in our personal worship and devotion. It's not that we be regular, you know, every day I do my diva. Or we finish reading the entire Bible in one year or less. I don't do that. I stay as far away as I can from that. Read the Bible in one year every day. You got your passage. I got to do my passage, you know. And oh, I had the flu. I had to bring the kids to the hospital. I missed Tuesday. I missed Wednesday. I missed Thursday. Oh, no, Friday. I got five days to do to catch up to my one year reading the Bible. What did you read? I don't know. I mean, it just went by so fast. We please God, we please my wife, we, you know, we be a good example. All these things have a place and a part in worship, but they're not the ultimate goal. It's not what we're striving for as we come before the Lord in humility and submission to commune with our God. The goal of our devotion, the final result of our worship in spirit and in truth, is transcendence. That's the goal. You know, someone says, what do I get out of it? Yeah, transcendence is what you get out of it. Now, before we explore this idea, let's first get a handle on the meaning of the word. If we understand the word, you know, we'll, we'll understand better the concept. To transcend means to go beyond the limit. There's a limit to transcend is to go beyond the limit, to surpass what is normal. For example, in the world of sport, Muhammad Ali, although he hasn't fought in decades and he's passed away now, but Muhammad Ali, the boxer, he transcended boxing and he became a social, religious and political icon. I mean, there were a lot of good boxers around, you know, Muhammad Ali, I mean, they knew who he was in Nigeria, and they knew who he was in, in the Middle East, and they knew who he was in South America. He never went to those places. He, he, he transcended boxing. Okay? So transcendence is an essential quality of God's being and character. He is beyond the material. He is beyond the natural. He is, as we say, supernatural. And so when I say that the result of worship is transcendence, I mean that our goal is to get beyond the time that we are worshiping, to get beyond the acts of worship. You know, some see the various acts of worship, prayer, excuse me, praise, preaching, the Lord's Supper, giving, fellowship, so on and so forth. They see those things as goals in themselves. But worship in spirit and truth, because I did these acts, 
or I did these acts often, or I did these acts well or sincerely or accurately, or I did them among 10,000 people, that's not what creates transcendence. God has given us these things so that we can communicate with him and in so doing transcend these things to a point where we actually experience him. We actually experience him. That's the point of worship. Transcendence in worship is the experiencing of God in our spirit. Am I describing something which is biblical or possible? Am I getting like, oh, uh -oh he's getting a little too Pentecostally for me? Well, in the Bible, those who served God and sought him out in prayer and worshipped him in spirit and truth, they had transcendent experiences of him. For example, Isaiah the prophet began his book by saying, the visions of Isaiah, which he saw, Isaiah 1 verse 1. Well, the visions that he saw, this is a transcendence of the prophet. He wasn't just a preacher or a teacher of the law. He wasn't just a counselor to the kings, but he was one who transcended all of these things to experience God through visions. Now, I'm not proposing that we have the same today. I'm merely showing an example of transcendence as experienced by one of God's special servants in the Bible. David, for example, in bringing the ark from Obed-Edom uh, to Jerusalem, he worshipped the Lord with praise, with sacrifices of animals. But in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6, it also says that David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. And upon seeing this, his wife, one of his wives, Michal, called him a fool and she chastised him. And David rebuked her because she couldn't see that he was celebrating before the Lord. He experienced a transcendent joy at the occasion that expressed itself in dance. Again, I'm not saying let's introduce dancing to our worship so we can attain transcendent experiences. That's not what I'm saying. However, if we experience transcendent in worship we might want to burst out in some form of express dance if that happened to us. You know, we read the Bible and not only marvel at, but we're hungry for the transcendent experiences that we see in the dreams of the prophets and the visions and the inspiration of the New Testament writers and the encounters with the Lord that Paul describes, for example. Even the powerful manifestations in the early church of mighty works and dynamic growth, even the ground shaking after the saints prayed in thanksgiving for the release of Peter and John from prison in Acts uh, chapter 4, verse 3. They had transcendent experiences in their worship and in their service to God. And I believe this is what we're missing. This is what we want for our worship to be satisfying and motivating. And I'm saying to you, it's a biblical thing. After all, if we meet to communicate with God himself, shouldn't this experience be as or even more dynamic than watching a movie or going to a concert or seeing a football game? And yet for many, for most, it isn't. Asked to use words to describe their worship experience, and uh, what we hear from the brethren, words like, well, it's a little boring. It was kind of long. Well, it's a duty, and I want to fulfill my duty to the Lord. Uh, well, it's pleasing to God, and that's what I want to do. Or it's the right thing to do. Or I fulfilled God's will. But we rarely hear the word transcendent. It was transcendent. Oh, it was so joyous. It was life-changing, bursting with happiness. Somebody said that to me, and I'd say, okay, you went to the Church of Christ? Is that where you went? Now, I have to make some disclaimers here so you do not misunderstand. Experiencing transcendence is not the goal of every worship service 
or personal devo or prayer. In other words, you don't make transcendence happen. It happens to you. Not because it can't happen, because we know that with God all things are possible. It doesn't happen all the time because we couldn't take it in our present sinful condition if it did. Transcendent comes in very small doses, enough for us to get a, a taste of the heaven that awaits us, but not so much that we are rendered useless here on earth. And it's that little taste, that experience of God, that is reserved for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. I tell you, if you experience transcendence in worshiping God, you never forget it. It drives the rest of your life in Christ. Mm. Okay, so now comes the hard question. Well, what about today? What is the nature of that transcendent experience? If it's not like a direct revelation through a dream or an inner voice, if it's not the empowerment to do miracles or to prophecy about the future, what is it exactly that you're talking about? Obviously, I don't know all the ways that God permits us to experience and know him, thus bringing us beyond the limits of human knowledge and into transcendence. But here are a few of the ways that we experience God today. Number one, we have that here I am Lord experience. I've even talked to some people here today and yesterday who have said, I've had, in one way or another, who have said, I had that here I am Lord experience. Some refer to it as a, a calling. You know, where somehow we just know that God is calling or directing us to a mission or a work or a task. It's always hard to explain to other people why. Because it's a transcendent experience. That's why you have to have experienced it to be able to understand what it is. Another example of transcendence today. You know, truly hearing the word. You know, the people that come forward, you know, after a service or something, and, and ask for prayer or want to be about, they, they have had or are having a transcendent experience. The word of God has pierced their heart and made them do something that goes beyond the ordinary. Imagine coming in front of 300 people and confessing your sin or saying, I need God, I don't care what anybody thinks. Sometimes we, we hear or we understand the word in a deeper and newer and more fulfilling way than ever before. This is transcendence. Have you never wept reading the Bible? Have you never wept and saw something that you have never seen before or understood something it, like it kind of snaps into place? I, I have wept. I've read something and gone, oh, Lord, you are so good. You are so wonderful. I, I've got no words. All I have to offer are my tears. All I have to offer is my weeping. Sometimes we see a vision of God's will. Not, not a supernaturally created vision, you know, like a burning bush or a valley of dry bones. But, but a real vision where real things and situations and people, they all come together like a puzzle, creating an image that you can actually see what God's word is pointing you to in a concrete way. That's a transcendent experience. The guy working at Canadian Tire who never goes to church and never read the Bible, he doesn't have that experience. He never in his whole life will see what God wants him to see. And then there's the transcendent joy that we experience when we see God's word and will fulfilled in our own lives or in the lives of other people. This too is transcendent. You know when you say, that was a God thing. You ever said that? That was a God thing. You could say, that was a transcendent experience. The same thing. 
It's when, it's when the, the, the presence of God crashes through the physical barrier into our world and we, we glimpse him just for a moment. That's transcendence. But beyond all of these, Paul describes the transcendent experience of realizing the power of God's love in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, verse 38, he says the following, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. Note the words he uses here. God's love is greater, meaning transcends death, life, spiritual beings, worries or fears, or any created thing. If this is transcendence, I don't know a better way to describe it. When you experience God's love, you've experienced a transcendent thing. Because God's love is otherworldly. When we are immersed in the full realization of God's love for us in Christ Jesus, we experience transcendence in its highest and purest form. Okay, let's talk about the problem now with transcendence. You see, the main problem or obstacle to our own experience of transcendence is fear. Fear. We're afraid because we've been taught that our only and true experience of God is intellectual and not emotional. In other words, we know God by knowing correct doctrines about God. That's, that's our approach. We know God by knowing correct doctrines about God. This is like saying, I know my wife by reading a report about her or listening to what her friends tell me about her. We can know God's will and purpose and character in this way, but we don't actually know him in this way. You see the difference? I mean, how would you rather know your wife? By getting a correct biological or anatomical report from her doctor? Or would you rather know her with a kiss? I don't know about you. <laughs> Which is better? Which is more intimate? The doctor's report or the kiss? Now there's a reason why we're afraid. And it has a lot to do with our history. The history I'm speaking of is the history of emotion and feeling and transcendence in the church, specifically our Restoration churches. It all starts with the Catholic Church. <clears throat> the Catholic Church called it mystery. The changing of the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood at communion was a mystery. They called it the transubstantiation. The, the, the bread became actually, the, in a mystical way, became the body of Christ. And the wine, in a mystical way, became the blood of Christ. And so every Sunday there was a miracle accompanied by otherworldly experiences like candles and rituals and imagery. They created this mystic experience through their religious service and their system. The saints and the relics and the pilgrimages and the shrines. And it went to a point where it didn't even resemble biblical Christianity anymore. And they did this in an effort to create transcendency. You see what I'm saying? The big tall buildings. Oh, the gold. The windows, the ornate artwork, the, the, uh, the priest's dress, the pope with the hat and the processions and the smoke and the, all the mumbo jumbo, you know, to create this uh, transcendency. And then along comes the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was largely a reaction a reaction to these practices 
which were for the most part unbiblical. And so Protestantism promoted an intellectual experience, a reasoned approach to religion to counterbalance the Catholic excess. Many Protestant groups took over Catholic churches in Europe and, and, and removed statues and painted over the frescoes on the ceiling and they replaced the stained glass in order to wipe away any suggestion of mystery. The goal was a purified and almost sterile environment. We, in the Restoration Movement, we come from this background. That's where we come from. Now, the problem for Protestants who broke away from Roman Catholicism based on the idea that only the Bible will guide us, not mystery or history or ceremony or papacy, the problem in Reformation thinking was this. Who is right when it comes to what the Bible says? I mean, there were a lot of different opinions on a lot of different matters. How, if we don't have a pope. We don't have a tiebreaker. How do we decide who's right and who's wrong? Well, historically, we're the ones who answered that question. Our movement said, correct doctrine through correct interpretation. The result was a movement that focused on being correct but rather lifeless. That was the trade-off. So the Catholics focused on the effect, mystery, and they neglected the actual cause, the Bible. And they ended up with a religion that didn't resemble Christianity anymore. We, in the Churches of Christ, we focused on the cause, the Bible, and we were afraid of the effect, transcendence, because we feared making a mistake and now, for the most part, we have lifeless churches and lifeless, you know, worship assemblies. Come on. Why do we have Keith Lancaster here to, to do what he's doing? We want to put life into the thing. We want to get up there. We want to learn how to worship. We want to praise. We want transcendence. Even though we haven't said so, that's what we're looking for. Well, along comes the Pentecostal movement. At the turn of the 20th century, by the way, if you don't know, there was no Pentecostalism in the 19th, 18th, 17th, 16th, 15th, 14th, 13th. There was no such thing. It all started in California at the turn of the 20th uh, century. And they put the feeling back into Christianity. Every service had a mystery. Because the Holy Spirit was at work every Sunday and Wednesday and Friday, giving people a transcendent experience, tongue speaking, prophecy, healing. And of course, to avoid the Roman Catholic error of neglecting the Bible by basing their claims and authority for the experience they had on the Bible. The Pentecostals said, this is the Bible. What we're doing is in the Bible. The results the fastest growing churches in the world. Why? Transcendence on demand. <laughs> Transcendence on demand. The problem? They use their own definition of what transcendence is and not the Bible's definition. Just as they use their own definition of tongue speaking or healing or prophecy and not what the Bible actually describes as legitimate examples of these phenomena. A religious example of the end justifying the means. In their case, a counterfeit and uh, uh, a, a counterfeit and uh, uh, they, excuse me, a counterfeit end pursued by an inaccurate means. So in the end, the Pentecostals are very much like Catholics. They focus on the results and they pursue this with whatever methods work using their growth as justification. We can't be wrong. We're growing so fast. Well, if we go by the biggest ones are, are right, well, the communist Chinese are right. <laughs> They've got the right philosophy because they're the biggest ones. If that's the way we're, we're going to judge what's right, according to size, now, the sad thing about Pentecostalism is that their system and their approach denies them the very thing that they seek, which is true transcendence. In other words, they've got the right idea, but they're using the wrong methods to get there. 
Okay, so someone might ask at this point, okay, well, what makes us so smart? What makes us better than them? Well, the only thing I can answer to that question is that at least we're asking the questions and seeking for answers and striving to find the perfect balance where we truly worship God in spirit and truth. Approaching Him in humility and submission, that's biblical. Communicating with Him according to His will and His purpose and not our own, this is biblical. And having that transcendent experience that must come from an encounter with the living God according to His will and not our will. Yeah, that's biblical as well. I believe that the place to return to, to restore our efforts to biblical worship, is not inventing new forms of worship, not increasing the repetition of the present forms. I believe the first step is to focus on our personal and corporate submission to God's Word, not just intellectualizing or debating it. Submission that brings us to transcendence. That's the point. Think about that for a second. Submission that brings us to transcendence requires, number one, it requires true obedience. If you say to me, okay, I get it, transcendence, the experiencing of God in my spirit, I get it, I get it, how, how, where do I start? True obedience, that's where you start. Obedience to the things you know and are convinced of now. I'll give you an example. I, 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 I was a smoker, I love to smoke. Somebody say, what's your hobby? I smoke. <laughs> I used to eat so I could smoke. You know, those are, how many ex-smokers here? Are you ready to admit? Not a one. You guys are bad. You're a bad guy back there. You're bad. Man, I tell you. So there are not a lot of people who can relate. But I want to tell you, if you were a smoker, I mean, I started smoking when I was 12, you know, and I smoked till I was 30. And when you smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, I mean, you, you eat in order to smoke because you eat and you want to finish eating so you can get to the cigarette at the end because that's the reward, right? Amen. Do I get an amen? Yeah, sure. All right, brother. Nobody ever amen that sentence in the history of the church. I just wanted to make sure this was the first time. So when I first became a Christian, I wasn't sure about which was the true church. I didn't quite understand about, you know, the Holy Spirit actually dwelling in, in me. And I, I couldn't explain to anybody the book of Revelation, you know, when I first became a Christian. But I was absolutely convinced that I had to give up smoking. <laughs> I knew that smoking was not a match for what I had just, you know, begun to, to be. This was what was required of me right away. It didn't matter that I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. It didn't matter that I couldn't debate somebody on what the book of Revelation said or didn't say. What was important was I knew that as a smoker I had to give up that nasty habit if I wanted to continue being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Nothing deep. No big theological thing. You know, some people, they wait to obey God until they understand everything. Submission to obey what you know is an act of faith towards God about what you don't know. <laughs> I obeyed God that thing because I was sure that's what he wanted of me at that moment. And because of that thing that I did nearly 30, 40 years ago, because of that, I'm here with you tonight. Had I said to myself, well, I can be a good Christian and smoke, I'll just cut down, or I'll just smoke outside, or I'll carry mouthwash with me, or when I go to church, like, I won't, I won't smoke on Sunday, blah, 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 you know? That's not what God wants. He wants us to do now what we know now we must do now. Submission that brings us to transcendence requires true obedience. Number two, true discipleship. Not just faithful attendance to services, 
True discipleship enables others to have the transcendent experience of seeing God living in, living in you. You get what I just said? True disciples enables others to have a transcendent experience by watching you. When they say, I never saw anything like that. We've all had that experience. Remember a couple of years back, some crazy guy went into a nursery school or something on a Mennonite, uh, a Mennonite school, and he murdered like 15 little children in the Mennonite community. It happened in the United States. Imagine a guy go in with a, a gun into like a nursery school and, and in cold blood murdered 15 little kids. And that guy was one of the, in the community. He was a Mennonite. His wife and child were part of the community. And of course, the newspapers and CNN, man, they were all over that thing. Oh boy, are you kidding? A religious person going in and killing children? I, they were having a field day with that thing. And the response of that Mennonite community, the elders, you know, went up and, you know, they had a, um, uh, a news uh, conference just the day after, and they announced, of course, they're sorry, there'll be funerals for the children, blah, blah, blah. And they announced that several of the elders had also visited the wife and the children of the murderer because they were part of the community and they also had been harmed by this. They didn't do anything wrong. By the way, I neglected to say, and the guy committed suicide, killed all the kids and killed himself. And then that community, you know what they did? They raised money to make sure that the child of the murderer had a college education because he no longer had a father. I mean, think about that. Forgiving our enemies, doesn't it come alive in that story? I mean, the whole United States had a transcendent experience that time. They said, wow, people I knew that were not members of the church, they said, are those your people that did that? Man, I ain't never seen anything like that. You know, you're right. Transcendent experience beyond what is, beyond what is, uh, what is normal. The purpose of discipleship is to bring others to Christ by allowing them a glimpse of him in you. My most rewarding and dynamic experience in Christ is seeing someone give themselves over to God more fully based in part on something maybe I have said or I have done to serve them in the name of the Lord. And then finally, submission means a true living sacrifice. Like all good things, there's a cost. The submission that leads to transcendence requires that we be ready to sacrifice what is precious to us. Now, don't get me wrong. God rarely asks someone to sacrifice what he's already blessed us with. Like he doesn't ask us to give up our families. He doesn't ask us to give up our peace of mind or our ministry. What he asks is for us to lay on the altar the things that are precious to us, but that do not come from him. See what I'm talking about? Things that are precious to us, but that do not come from him. For example, our secret sins. They are precious to us, but do not come from him. The source of our pride. Maybe we're good looking. Maybe we got money. Maybe we got a skill. I don't know. Whatever it is. The dreams and goals of our own making. The delights of this world which in themselves may not be evil, but together get in the way of offering ourselves up as a complete sacrifice to God. These are the things that mark those who are fully engaged in obedience to God's word. I want to tell you something. I make the joke about smoking because I'm, you know, you know, <laughs> nearly half a century removed from when I used to smoke. It doesn't bother me anymore. You know, actually, I, I hate the smell of it now. 
But at the time, <laughs> I mean, you know, I did drugs for years and years. And I can tell you right now, it's a lot easier to give up dope than it was to give up smoking cigarettes. The hardest thing I ever did in my whole life was give up cigarettes. And the only way that I could get my mind around it, I would pretend every time I had the urge to smoke, that I was putting that cigarette on the altar and offering it up to God as a sacrifice. Because I didn't want to give him anything that didn't cost me something. And believe me, every time I denied myself the urge to smoke, it cost me a lot. It cost me a lot. It was something that I had that was precious to me, that gave me great satisfaction, physical satisfaction, but that didn't come from him. He wanted to give me something that would bring me satisfaction. But he couldn't, so long as I was married, so long as I was addicted to that thing. It got in the way. These are the things that mark those who are fully engaged in obedience to God's word. They may not be as flashy, you know, and charismatic as a modern hip worship service. They may not be as easy to define and explain as a three-part sermon with PowerPoint. But in the end, they will enable us to worship God in a way that he seeks us to worship him. And will reward us with a more perfect knowledge and experience of our Lord. Something that is called transcendence. Remember, Jesus referred to transcendence when he said, And this is eternal life. That you will know God and his Son, Jesus Christ. That word know there, that's not like, you know, hey, I know that guy. That word know there, that you will know God. That's the same word as in the Old Testament, you know, when, when they're talking about a man and his wife, and it says, and he knew her, and she became pregnant. That word no in the Old Testament was talking about intimacy, sexual intimacy. It's the same word, that you shall know God. You shall be intimate with God and his son, Jesus Christ. What Jesus was talking about here was transcendence. I pray that as we continue to develop our ability to worship God in spirit and in truth, we will experience each one of you transcendence. And when you do, believe me, there's no going back. <laughs> there's no going back. I pray that you will be blessed with transcendence. I look forward to tomorrow when we will actually come together as the church to worship God, to take of the communion, to worship him in spirit and in truth. Thank you very much for your attention.